typically speaking, when you have a moment like this, you try to lighten up and give a, you know, nice little joke or something. But I'm, I'm kind of serious tonight. And the reason I'm serious is because I really believe what God is doing in this time is, uh, this is a momentous time. And we really have to get this thing right in tune to what we believe the Lord is saying. So we're, we're, we're honored tonight to be able to tie it up and begin to really fine tune what we believe God is saying. And I do want to say that I'm aware that a number of people probably are looking on streaming and uh, listening to this maybe some other time. So we recognize that really we're not just speaking to you, we're speaking to the generation. But I believe that God wants to do something special in the church that can model out to the world what true reconciliation and healing will really look like. So we talked about a lot that we talked about, so I'm, I'm going to jump into some things specifically that we've covered in our conference, and I want to just kind of fine-tune it, if I could. One thing you've heard a lot that we talked about is dealing with the area of justice. You mentioned justice. And I just want to bring this to attention because we've actually even brought, drew a line, which is a correct line I think that we should have looked at, from, from slavery to, uh, to Jim Crow to even, as they call, New Jim Crow. And those of you not familiar with that terminology, that's like that pipeline we talked about from the public schools to prison. In many cases, in these cases, we're talking specifically about the black community that has been subject to these kind of things. And so as a result of that, we, we looked at it's the same spirit that's carried on. And uh, so, so we, we've tossed the, this word around justice quite a bit because we do realize that once you reconcile, some even say you can't be reconciled unless there's justice. Some say you can't do the gospel unless there's justice. It's a lot of just swirling around related to it. But let me just spend a little moment just to say something about it. Uh, as you know, I'm, my background also is uh, I'm an attorney, so I usually think of things very specifically in terms of exactly what it means. And then also, I consider myself uh, a man of the, of the Bible, so I'm a biblicist. So I want to make sure that what I say is also de de definitely coordinated specifically in the Word. So, uh, so one of the things about justice, I want to just say this to you, justice actually really means... Um, in a natural, it means to acquit or punish every person on the merits of a case. In, in law for specifically, you're, you're doing something on the merits of the case, but it's regardless of race or social status. So this is why we, we're looking at this terminology. So anyone that does something wrong, it should be given the, the same penalty. Now, in, in Hebrew, the word for justice means mishpat. M-I-S-H-P-A-T, and which is used over 200 times in the Old Testament. Mishpat is, is mentioned over 200 times in the Old Testament. And what it actually means is, is giving people what they're due, whether it's punishment or protection or care. Punishment, protection, or care. And... Um, you guys have heard about lady justice, and this is just a, a, something you have in your mind. In law, they use this quite a bit. If you put the graphic up, I'll explain it to you real quickly. It has to do with where I'm going with it, so bear with me for a second. But lady justice, it's, a, it's an example there. Yeah, there we go. That, that where this woman is, she's standing there, but you notice she's blindfolded. So the blindfold represents objectivity. It, in that justice, it's, it should be meted out without without. With, uh, with objectivity, without fear or favor, regardless of money, wealth, power, identity. It's a blind justice and, and totally impartial. Uh, in her left hand, you see that she holds a balance of scales, which represents the weighing of the evidence. The weighing of the evidence, which is taken uh, with the blindfold. It's, it's, it's symbolizing that it's weighed on its own merit. And then if you see on, 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 her, on her right hand there, uh, it's actually turned around a little bit, so, but it, the way it is, you can still see. The right hand of Lady Justice seems to have a sword that faces downward. And this sword represents the punishment. And the sword is held below the scales, though, to show that evidence in the court has to be determined before the punishment. 
reason I want to say that to you is because we, we term it, use the word justice quite a bit, justice in a way, but it all deals with fairness. And, and so now I'm looking at in the natural, the, the world is crying out for justice. As a matter of fact, when people are victimized, they tend to cry out for justice. We've mentioned that before. But, it, but in Isaiah 59, it talks about a people that are crying out for justice but it's almost like God didn't hear them. Now listen to what I'm saying. When God gives us true justice, he gives it based on the condition of the heart of the people. You've heard it even said that many times when it said when the people have godly people in, in office, the re people rejoice because there's a freedom that comes. But typically speaking, God deals with us based on what we deserve, on our spiritual condition. So when we look at what is going on, look at with me if you can, Isaiah 59. It's a pretty strong scripture, but just look at me in Isaiah 59 here. I'm going to just read it to you. I'm going to read it out of New Living Translation, if you have it there. Go back and read it. I'm going to jump through some of the scriptures here. But it says, listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's turned away and will not listen anymore. Your hands are hands of murderers, and your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies, and your mouth spews with corruption. No one cares about being fair and honest. The people's lawsuits are based on lies. They conceive evil deeds and give birth to sin. So there, there's no justice among us. We know nothing about right living. We look for light, but we find only darkness. We look for bright skies, but we walk in gloom. We growl like hungry bears. We, we mourn like mournful doves. We look for justice, but it never comes. We look for rescue, but it's far away from us. Our courts oppose righteousness, and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the street. Honesty has been outlawed. Yes, truth is gone, and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. The Lord looked and was displeased to find there was no justice. He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm and his justice sustained him. He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed him with a robe of vengeance and wrapped him in a cloak of divine passion. See, when God begins to talk about justice, first of all, he's looking at the condition of the people. There is no outward justice without a heart that cries out for purity. Justice alone is subject to subjectivity because justice by itself is what's fair to me. So in other words, if you treat me fairly because I'm black, I'm happy. Or because I'm a man, I'm happy. I've actually aged a little. I mean, I'm not 25, so, you know, if you're 60, I'm happy. Whatever it would do that works well with me, but justice for me may not be justice for you if it's just that word alone. 
but it has to be coupled with another word called righteousness. Justice has to have a twin. The two have to work together. There has to be justice and righteousness living together for, to please God. So we can cry out for justice in the streets all day long. He's looking for our heart because are we treating each other right? Are we giving to each other just in the natural, how we treat one another? Justice. How we treat one another. It's amazing how I, have to, I don't have very much time, so I'm going to have to be very direct. It's amazing how, and amazing how we were very, very concerned about how the government has treated us and things that have happened, yet the highest rate of homicide is blacks killing blacks. On the other side of the coin, the white community is so consumed with itself that even the justice system itself is not based on truth. It's how I can benefit by, by doing plea bargains as opposed to looking for true guilt or innocence. If you get a plea, I'll get you out. If you don't, we're going to convict you whether you're innocent or not. What has happened is our whole justice system is full of lies. So do we really want God's justice? <laughs> we want justice, but we want our justice. We want what's fair. I guarantee you that if one person came and said, give us justice, the gospel cries out for justice, the Bible cries out for justice, I guarantee you one person's viewpoint on justice, depending on where they are on this pendulum swing, would be quite different than somebody else's justice. Unless you define it by a biblical standard. The Bible example of justice is fairness, but it's a biblical fairness. If you start, begin to go down in here a little bit more, and I want you to meditate on this stuff. Here in Psalms 89, 14, Psalms 89, 14, it says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness goes before you. See, see, biblical justice is an enactment of God's nature. But it, it means confronting evil and making right those things that are wrong. But when we look at it, it still is based on a standard. And what is that standard? It's the standard of Christ Jesus. Jesus became the standard of our righteousness to even have right standing between us and God. Do you realize, let's be clear, I was just talking about this recently, that God put the Israelites, the Israel, Israel in captivity under Babylonian captivity. He put them in there for 70 years because they became so prideful, they became like the world, that therefore he put them, he did, not the, not the king, he put them in captivity. Why? Because until he was ready to deliver them out, they became slaves under a Babylonian system. When he called them out, when he saw their hearts so ready, he brought them out and so they could flourish, so they could have the, what the land that he called them to. He's calling us as a nation to a land where we're serving God, black and white, Hispanic, Asian, because all of us will be around that throne worshiping him, not even seeing the color, but the color is a benefit to him because he created us in his own image. So the, the diversity that we have is in the image of God not because it serves my purpose. Blackness can't serve my purpose. My blackness has to serve his purpose. 
The differences in the culture can serve our agenda. It has to serve his agenda. So any way is separated from his heart, then it's not justice at all that he will approve of. So really, this is why it has to begin in the church. The church of Jesus Christ is the only way. I just read it to you. They can cry out in the street. They can cry out for justice, but still they're not acting in a biblical way toward each other. The way he determines whether you really want justice is how you treat one another (laughs) one-on-one. If you need forgiveness, you forgive. If you need love, you love. To give, to receive. So everything that is given, that's what you receive. So he looks at our, the righteousness of our heart and right standing. That shows whether our nation truly wants, regardless of race, whether we're crying out for fairness before God, understanding biblical truth. That's so what he does tell us, and this is the way he cha- challenges us. He begins to talk to us here. Let, let this scripture, I want to just give this scripture. It says, it says, Give justice to the weak. This is Psalm 82, 3. Give justice to the weak and to the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. He goes on further. He says again, and he says this this righteousness that we're looking for comes from God through the faith in Jesus Christ to whom we believe in Romans 3. In other words, He's saying, give to those people. Now, the fatherless, let's just go down the road. Care for the fatherless. Care for the orphan. To make things that are right. He said, those are the ones. He said, I give justice to the weak and the fatherless. He cares about those people that can't help themselves. So the first biblical justice goes to the weak. The wheat may not be black, it could be white, it could be Asian, it could be immigrants, it could be anything, any way you want to look at it. That's why even our definition, let me be real clear, get out here and be a little controversial. So, the way we deal with those coming in, we have a, we should have a, 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 a policy that relates to protection of our borders. Clearly we do. But for the church, we welcome in strangers and foreigners. We love them no matter, we're not going to love them because whether, whether, whether they're legitimate or whether they are legal or whatever, they, they've gone through the constitutional provision. We're going to love them anyway. Why? Because we love people. We were called as a grace that loves. We're drawing them in. That's just like the whole idea of uh, homosexuality. Man, we love somebody. Please come to my church if you're homosexual. Please, I'm going to love you through, I believe you're adulterer. Come on in my church. So I can love you through your, your, your sin to bring you into right standing with God because it's not till you get in right standing that you can even ask for a just God. Now, we do serve a just God. Let me just say this, people. Sometimes we don't want to hear it. But even the just God told, told, told the Jews, told Moses, he told Joshua, he went right down the line. So listen, when you go in there and you take the land, I want you to kill out the whole, all of them. The mamas, the babies, the kings, all of them, kill them all. What? Will a just God tell you to go in and destroy everything? Yes, he will. He doesn't explain his definition of what's just. He's looking for us to stay in right standing with him and care for those with needs. Those in prison, when when you visited me, when I hungry, you fed me. He constantly says, if you would do it on a a level, a smaller level, I believe you really want it on a broader level. So we start the justice not by what we're demanding on the outside. We start the justice by what we're doing internally. Do we take care of our own people? Do we love unconditionally? Reconciliation. We got to understand that you got two parts. Ecclesiastes, it says that the, the key is held from the oppressed and the oppressor. The oppressed holds the key to the oppressor's deliverance. 
and the oppressor holds the key to the oppressed deliverance. Why? Because each one has to come to a place of brokenness that they literally will die to themselves. The oppressed will say, I, I forgive you. Now, regardless of whether the oppressor deserves forgiveness, says forgive and you shall be forgiven. So this is not based on the person that you're forgiven, their attitude, their pride, their, their anxiety, all the things that they have. You, 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 you have to forgive unconditionally. God's got to touch your heart to, you, to forgive without a condition of their apology or their, for, or their confession. And then if there's any hope of us being one, there's any hope of us being one, I got to find a way to die. I have to find a way to die that not only will I confess my fault of having hatred and bitterness, I came out of that background. I don't have time to go through my whole background, but I was, I was basically raised in a black environment here in Atlanta, I, I, black nursery school, right not too far from here, black high, black elementary school, black high school, black, black college, black law school. I mean, what I'm saying is everything in my definition for what was right was through the lens of my blackness. So it was only Jesus Christ that could heal my heart to recognize that, there's a, that sin has no color or no culture. So therefore, my heart has to be broken. And I got to be able to say, I forgive you. Well, well, how far do we go back? I'm willing to forgive 400 years back. But do you see the devastation that it has? And this is what we want you to understand. That's why we have spent some time. It's been incredible devastation. Do you know from chains, be it men being brought here in chains, human beings, as it was brought up earlier, human beings brought here, enslaved, breaking up families, women like sex objects, the children, grow, they, they, they fear the, the, the master, the, the families are still broken up. I believe some of the devastation in the black community right now still goes all the way back to a 400-year history. Well, we have 70 to 75% of one child is born, born in, a ch in a household with one parent. I believe there's still a curse that's there. But the curse is not going to be broken based on somebody giving you reparations. The curse is going to be broken by you dying before the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me. Because if I hold hatred or bitterness or anything in my heart toward you, I am wrong. I'm sorry. I forgive. And then this is the harder part. Because I can't be one with you. I can't be one with you unless I release you. Because if I'm holding something and feel like you owe me, I can't be one with you. Now, this is all in the context. Of, I'm not talking about government now. I'm talking about in the church. I can't be one with you unless I release you. Now, if I may... Obviously, I'm not white, but just assume I'm white right now, okay? <laughs> now, I see this black man. I understand what he went through. Talking about 400 years. Why well, wasn't there? I didn't do it. I don't own slaves. I don't even know what my family did. Matter of fact, I, I immigrated here from somewhere else. I don't get the benefit of it. What I'm saying is that, but can you come into a church and you start hearing the pain that people are still suffering? Families that are still destroyed, things that are still going on that's in the black community, people are still killing one another, still out of some of the same things that have gone, generational curses that have been there. And I'm saying, Lord, what can I do? I'm so sorry for what I've done as a white man. I'm so sorry for what my fathers have done. Please forgive us. But it's true that Zacchaeus, out of his own heart, not because it was required. I want to be real clear. Zacchaeus was not required 
But, but, but like David said, when the curse came down, he said, I'm not going to do anything unless it costs me. So sacrifice, what can I do as a sacrifice to rebuild a community that was broken by my ancestors? So even if you say no I'm, and you release me, I'm saying yes. I got to give you full forward what you lost. So no longer is it me as a black man requiring something of you because you aren't there yet. I have to release you from any debt. In other words, you don't owe me anything. Because we'll want, if we don't get that oneness, because everybody's not going to get it anyway. Someone was saying earlier, man, can you forgive us? Because sometimes we're going to say things wrong. We're going to do absolutely, I forget. Man, I say things wrong. I say things not right right now. We, we easily categorize people. We, we easily put people in a presidential slant. Oh, yeah, well, you know, yeah, you say, well, well he's white. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's Asian. Yeah, you know how. <laughs> oh, he's Hispanic. You know how they are. So, so we, do, we categorize people inappropriately, and it goes against the nature of God. There is not one person that doesn't have a sin to confess. The Bible says if you say you're without sin, then you're a liar. So nobody, listen to this, deserves anything but the reference, the grace, the forgiveness, and the healing of the Holy Ghost. For us to get to the place that God's called us to be, we got to live in a righteous standard. I want to leave with this scripture right here. I, I always, I, I love this scripture so much, but I have to keep going here because to me it's the, it's the most important scripture that relates to revival. We were just talking about revival. Revival revives a man. When we come on one accord, see this is the other part. It's, it's so important for us to come together because we need us to be on one accord for revival to hit. I think the reason that we don't have much revival in America is because we haven't come on one accord. God will give us a little taste over here. You know, maybe uh, it might be a, a, a Jesus culture revival, or it might be a Toronto revival, or it might be a, a, a Florida revival, Pensacola revival. And, and if you go back far enough, there was a Azusa Street revival. But I'm telling you right now, God wants to do blow. He said the Spirit of God is going to come. The Spirit of Elijah is going to come. He said, well, I'm my sons and my daughters. He's going to pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. I believe he's going to prophesy. We're going to see great things take place. But he's still waiting on us to take those 10 days in the upper room where we're one accord and one heart. And then what this scripture says right here, it says, 5715 said, For thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and a holy place. Obviously, that's where God dwells. But he also dwells with who else? With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. He's only going to come to a contrite, which means broken. A contrite that's open to God. He's only going to come to not a prideful heart, not a demanding heart. But he's only going to come to a broken and contrite heart. That's where I'm going to dwell. Then he goes on further. And he says, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So the requirement for revival is not because we're yelling out at the top of our voice, Lord, revive us. The context of this scripture is telling us, I'm going to revive you when you are contrite, broken, and humble enough to cry out to me. And say, Lord, I'm not holding any grudges about anything. I'm past, I'm way past that. God's got to get into a place that we way past some of the things we still have to talk about. It's a shame the world has dictated to the church that we have to have a priority to even talk about what we're dealing with right now. We have to break down these bonds. We got to love on one another, walk with one another, care about one another. Listen, there are people in your own race sometimes, you're at church and you give them a nice little holy hug and you really don't care what's going on in their household. 
You don't really want to know. So a person can say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Fine, good, because I don't really want to know what's going on to you. So, of course, white folk don't really care what you're going on, black people. Black people don't really care what y'all dealing with, white people. They think y'all are rich anyway. But I'm saying, you have these attitudes that you carry. We got to care beyond ourselves, break down our walls, man. We got to go past ourselves and love each other unconditionally. I believe that God will bring more than we ever have asked for. I couldn't ask you for a million dollars. You'll give me five million if I ask you for a million. Why? Because your heart would be so broken for what has happened over these years that we want to see communities rebuild. And it's not only just black communities. Many communities have been, re- have been de- devastated because the sin of our nation, it's not race, we know it. It's the sin of our nation. And he says that anybody that will care about what I care for. Lord, I just pray right now. And Lord, that you can affect our hearts. Lord, we really want to serve you and we really want to be the church that you called us to be. We don't want the world to dictate what we think about ourselves. And Lord, we do want justice. We do cry out for it, but Lord, we want your justice, Lord. And we don't even know what that is. Do we really want that? Help us, Lord, to care about the homeless and the blind and the fatherless among us, Lord. Help us to care And Lord, we don't necessarily really care because so much is black or white. We care because if a fatherless man is there, if an orphan is there, man, we care for them regardless of their culture or their race. Lord, help me to care for a white baby that's an orphan as much as I want a white man to care for a black baby that's an orphan. Help me to love beyond myself. Help me, Lord to be in right standing with you and that because of my right standing with you based upon my love and my model of Jesus Christ we will ask you for justice coupled with righteousness we love you and we bless you now for this in Jesus name